All right, we are live. I want to thank everyone, both physically present and those who are watching online, um, to be joining us this evening. We have Dr. Ming Yi. She is a uh, currently a postdoc at the University of California at um, Berkeley. Um, she is uh, previously uh, got her PhD in physics at Stanford in 2014, and prior to that, she got her BS in physics at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. Superconductors all the way down. Uh, we are looking forward to her presentation today on unraveling the mysteries of superconductors. Take it away, Dr. Yi. Okay, thank you very much, Will. Thank you for having me. Uh, I want to apologize because I'm a little under the weather, so please excuse me for that, <laughs> that distraction. Um, okay, so let me share the screen. Um, okay. Wait. Now we're cooking. Okay, we're good? We're good. Okay, great. Thank you. So um, today we're going to talk about superconductors, and um, I hope um, I will first tell you a little bit about what superconductors are, what makes them special, and um, and then we'll talk about some of the applications that they have. Um, and then I will tell you a little bit about what is it like to do research in this area, uh, what are some of the experimental tools that we use, and also what are some of the questions that we ask uh, to advance this field. And um, so let's begin. Um, so my name is Ming, um, and I've worked on superconductors for almost a decade now. Um, so what, what is superconductivity? Uh, so all superconductor, all superconducting materials have must have two uh, required uh, properties. One, which is shown on the left, is the loss of electrical resistance below a certain temperature. So here, what, I, what I'm showing you is the resistance measured. Um, the top curve belongs to a non-superconducting metal. And you can see the resistance remains finite all the way down to, below, to zero temperature. But for a superconductor, on the other hand, at a certain temperature, critical te temperature, which is called TC, it suddenly drops to complete zero. And this is the manifestation of superconductivity. Another really cool uh, property is this expulsion of magnetic field. So when a material becomes a superconductor, it expels all the magnetic field. And you can imagine if you put the superconductor on top of a strong magnet, the magnetic field is going to try to push into the superconductor. And the superconductor will try to push out the magnetic field. And that force is strong enough to counteract gravity so that you can have a piece of material levitating on top uh, of another object. This is really cool. Um, so I'm going to show you a short video of me playing with a superconductor. Um, so here is me on the right. Uh, on the bottom here, this is a little gadget with uh, pieces of uh, strong magnets. Uh, what I'm holding is a, a, set, a set of tongues. Uh, I'm dunking a piece of high temperature superconductor in liquid nitrogen, which, which is really cold uh, liquid to cool the material down below its TC. I'm going to take it out and then put it on top of the magnet and you can see what happens. So here we go. Uh, yeah. So that that is a real superconductor in wow. action. Yeah, it's pretty cool. After studying these materials for 10 years, I finally got to play with them uh, last year. <laughs> yeah, it's good to, to, to look at them. Um, and a huge chunk of material. How, how big is that? Oh, actually, the, the whole thing is not a all superconducting material. Uh, it's only a small piece in the middle. The rest, rest of it is a foam for soaking up the liquid nitrogen to keep it cool. Ah. Uh, yeah, if the nitrogen evaporates, then the material will go back to normal state and won't, and won't levitate anymore. So, yeah, most of it is just, yeah. But you can search for there's lots of cool videos online on YouTube where they people have built like um, superconductors um, on top of Mobius strips, which can go forever, and it's really <laughs> fun to watch. Yeah, check them out. Okay, so now we know there are two properties. So, what do they have to do with us? Like, what do they mean in real life? They these two properties can have really cool uh, applications. Um, so for the loss of electrical resistance on the left-hand side, uh, 
What it means is that when electricity travels in these materials, there is no resistance, so they do not lose any energy to heat. So that you can imagine, um, for power transmission, these materials are very highly efficient. So in this picture compares, on the left-hand side is um, power cable made of conventional wire. I think it's copper over here, which is already a really good conductor. But on the right-hand side, it's set of uh, superconducting material that is needed for uh, transmitting the same amount of power as the conventional one. You can see it's very efficient. It, it only uses a fraction of the material size. So it's, it, this can really benefit um, uh, energy or energy problems. And then the cooler application is on the right-hand side, which uh, uses the magnetic levitation. So because of the strength of this uh, uh, expulsion of magnetic field is so strong, you can uh, a whole whole set of trains can be levitated on top of tracks, um, and then carrying uh, tons of people. So these trains are traveling in air, and um, you can imagine because without friction they can travel at much faster speeds. The only thing stopping them is the air resistance, making them um, theoretically capable of achieving like similar to air travel. So here is a picture of a maglev train in Japan, which set the record for uh, traveling at a speed of 374 miles per hour, which is approaching air travel. Um, yeah, and, then you can, and these things are really quiet because they, they're not like clunking on top of the tracks. So they're, they're, they're great. So now you can imagine if you can get rid of all that air, you can even further um, uh, make, 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 you can, you can uh, get rid of the air drag so that they can achieve theoretically to even higher uh, speeds. So people have built a track. Uh, this is a built in a university in, in China, where they made a tube uh, where they can pump down the air to maybe like a tenth of uh, atmosphere, and this way, theoretically, speeds can travel can can reach up to eighteen hundred miles per hour, which is three times the the speed for air travel. And just to put that on, in perspective. That will get you from Paris to, to Moscow in under an hour. So you can technically have breakfast uh, in Paris and lunch in Moscow. That these things are, they're 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 only limited by our imagination. So I think that they're really cool. They have some really cool applications. Hey, uh, Dr. Yi, is that the uh, the basis for um, that hyperloop? Sorry? Is that, is that is that the basis for the, the hyperloop? How uh, Elon Musk's idea of having a fast, rapid transit sort of system is that maglev or is that just air pressure? That's uh, I'm not sure. I'm not sure about that. Um, I don't know about that, but um, I would. Yeah. So I, for me, this kind of this kind of uh, this kind of setup is what can achieve the high speed, so I don't know if there are other kinds of uh, setups that can do this. Cool. But basically this just reduces everything to air, air drag, so you know, you're making ground transportation you know, equivalent to air travel, mm -hmm. if you can build tracks. Mm -hmm. um, so actually superconductors are more common than we realize. Uh, so the, here is the periodic table, you can see most of the elements are superconductors one way or another. Uh, the ones in blue are the ones that just superconduct at ambient pressure. The ones in green um, will superconduct at, under some high pressure. So the question is, why don't we see superconductors you know, more in our daily lives? The problem is there's a limiting factor. So come, coming back to this plot, um, which shows the resistance, you know, we said that there, the, the material only becomes a superconductor below a temperature. Which is, called, which is called TC. So it only works under this temperature. The problem is for most of these elements, this temperature is really low, only a few degrees above absolute zero. So to make these things into applications, we would need lots of very expensive cooling power uh, to hold them in that state. And that's why um, it, practically it, right now it's, it's a technical challenge. So the goal uh, for people working in superconductors is to find materials that can become superconducting at high temperatures or even room temperature, um, which will drastically you know, reduce this maintenance cost and make them more practical. So what is it like 
uh, to have a world with room temperature, dream room temperature superconductors. Um, maybe some of you are young, uh, old enough to have seen the movie Avatar. Um, and remember, there are these large floating pieces of land. Um, actually, in that imaginary world, that material is a room temperature superconductor. So, in their in their in their in their um, imagined world, these materials are naturally superconducting at room temperature, so they can float on top of you know a large magnetic field. So you can imagine if we had room temperature superconductors, then you know our world would be drastically different. And yeah, so this is our goal. Um, so back to reality. Uh, let me tell you. Um, there's a timeline of uh, what kinds of superconductors has ha have have been discovered. Um, so on the vertical axis is the uh, critical temperature or transition temperature TC of the materials, and then on the horizontal axis is uh, the year of their discovery. So initially, the first one uh, was a super first superconductor was discovered by um, Cameron Onis in 1911. And he won the Nobel Prize for it two years later uh, for mercury. Um, this was an accident. He was the first one to liquefy uh, helium, and then he just cooled things down. There, electricity was electrical resistance was gone, so he discovered superconductivity. And then, following that, uh, the series of materials that have been discovered all had very low TCs. So these are what people have called conventional superconductors, and um, then in um, in the 70s, these three gentlemen, uh, Barding, Cooper, and Schrieffer, they uh, came up with a beautiful theory that explains the conventional superconductors, which is named after them, called BCS theory. So basically, um, the key of this theory is that if you look at this uh, schematic on top, so these white dots are the lattice of a, of a material. So like, there may be the nuclei, which are, which are positively charged. And then you have these electrons, which are negatively charged, floating through these materials. And you can imagine, because opposite charges attract, so when one electron flows through this lattice, it sort of attracts the lattice and warps them a little bit to make a hump. And then you have a second electron zipping through, and that negative charge is then uh, attracted to this hump. So effectively, through the lattice, these two electrons are kind of uh, pair together, and they're called a Cooper pair. And it's because of this pairing of two electrons that helps these two electrons to become a bound state, and they can travel in the material without bumping to other things. So the strength um, of this bound, uh, of this uh, of pairing, uh, it's called pairing, uh, is what um, lets superconductors, uh, let, let electrons flow through the material without, uh, without uh, resistance. So this is the key to the, to the theory, which was great uh, and explained all these conventional superconductors. But this theory had a sort of like a theoretical limit uh, of how high the TC can go based on this mechanism, which is pretty low on the order of 30K. And then another accident happened. So the, 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 the timeline of superconductors is full of surprises and really good surprises. So in um, 1986, um, so Bett and Mueller found a series of materials which had really high TC compared to the previous uh, set of materials. So all of these had a, in them a um, um, copper, so they became known as the cuprates. Um, so these materials um, are two-dimensional layered um, synthesized compounds um, in contrast to the elements that we've seen before. Um, and the important thing is that the TC of these materials uh, largely exceeded the liquid nitrogen uh, temperature, which is 77K. And the key for that is that um, liquid nitrogen is, is very cheap. Um, it's much cheaper than liquid helium, which um, can cool things down to 4K. And because this thing's really cheap, then these materials can be um, much more practical for applications. Um, because this, the nitrogen is basically free. Um, so, but these materials do not fall under the mechanism of a BCS theory. So people still don't understand why these materials superconduct. And that's, that's one of the goals in the field is figure out 
a theory that can explain these materials. And these materials uh, became known also as high, uh, high TC, high transition temperature uh, superconducting materials, or high TC. So this is what we're actively searching for, a theory for these materials. And then uh, another accident happened. Um, so this is this is this was in two thousand and um, eight. Um, this gentleman Hosono, uh, he was working in the field of transparent electronics, uh, electron transparent electronic displays, and he was looking for materials and along those lines. And then he bumped into a compound uh, that also turned out to be a superconductor with a TC higher than the BCS limit. And subsequently, this was another class of materials discovered, which all had in them iron. So they became known as iron nicktides. And um, this material um, was the second class of high, te high temperature uh, superconductors. And so now people are really happy because before, people only had one class of materials to study. And so they were trying to figure out theory. But now there are two families. So basically, people can compare and contrast the two families and try to figure out a general explanation for this high, high TC uh, phenomena. So uh, the discovery of this iron nicktides happened just as I entered graduate school. So for <laughs> all of my PhD years, I just focused on the study of these materials. And so this is what I will talk about uh, for the rest of the talk. I will focus on the, these materials. So again, the goal um, uh, for us is to figure out what is the fundamental mechanism uh, for high temperature superconductivity. And by knowing that, hopefully we can know the direction how to make materials or find materials with higher TC, um, which would be beneficial for applications. And just one more plug. Uh, last year, a very exciting thing happened. Last year, um, the another material, which is um, um, sulfur hydride, uh, H3S, shown here. Uh, this is a gas. Uh, it's a it's the gas responsible for making that rotten egg smell. Uh, but this gas um, was shown to superconduct at really high TC of 200 K, which is minus 70 degrees Celsius um, under a lot of pressure. So 90 gigapascal is about uh, almost a million times of the atmospheric pressure. So people have, uh, this is a group of Russian scientists that found that um, by subjecting this gas under this a lot of pressure, it becomes a, a metal. Uh, it becomes a metal, a solid, and then it superconducts. Um, this is the currently the record uh, of superconductivity. Um, but this gas is toxic, explosive, flammable, and you also <laughs> need to put this under a lot of pressure. So, application right now is a little difficult for that. Uh, at least it shows us there is hope towards uh, room temperature superconductivity. Um, so. Um, Another thing is, I just want to mention that based on this plot, you can see uh, many things happen. Many discoveries were made by accidents. So theories have limits, which um, you know should not be the limit for you know stop uh, stopping us to 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 study certain materials. But um, there are al always surprises that, that that can be made that you know that proves some theories are wrong, and then you can you need to make new theories. So this is one of the excite excitement of working in this field. Um, okay, so let me focus on the iron nicktides because um, this is what most of the talk will be about. So you're not supposed to be able to really read this plot. Uh, this is just to give you a sense of, this is the uh, amount of just some examples of the iron-based superconductors discovered within uh, the first year of discovery of these materials. and. Uh, they're just all over the map, and each one of them is, is, is a family of, of superconductors. So there are a lot. Um, and, but uh, there are some organization to this. So if we break them all of them down, they can actually be separated into different families. And this is, a sh this is showing a um, crystal structure for each family. And if you just focus on this box uh, highlighted here, you can see that it has the same structure. Uh, which is this? These blue uh, dots, which represent iron atoms, and then these uh, whitish colored dots, those are arsenic or selenium. So all of them have these iron planes, and that's what they all have in common. And then the only difference between them is that uh, you may have different number of these iron iron planes, or you may have different stuff in between these layers. 
and uh, they are named by numbers uh, based on the the formula of their chemical uh, based on their chemical formula. But because they all have in common this iron arsenic plane, we know that the the central physics uh, for describing these materials must come from this iron plane. So we 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 focus on our study of the of, of these uh, materials based on uh, based on studying these iron planes. <laughs> Sorry. We're okay. Nope. Okay. Okay. Um, uh, let me just uh, introduce a little bit about how uh, superconductivity arises in these materials. Uh, so here is a blown up, blown up of one of the one of the crystal structures, and this uh, yellow layer is the iron arsenic layer. And uh, one way to achieve superconductivity is that. Uh, they are doped. What that means is that uh, these materials, uh, uh, the s grown compounds, are not superconductors. And in order to make them superconducting, um, the interlayers must have some extra uh, charge carrier. So, for example, electrons, which are donated to this iron arsenic plane. So, uh, these these uh, donated electrons somehow um, flow in this layer and and, and mediate superconductivity. And um, people have found that. With different amounts of uh, what's this is called doping, uh, which is the um, just introducing carrier, charge carrier into the uh, into the into the compound. Uh, people have seen that with different amount of doping, the superconducting transition temperature TC uh, is um, can be uh, optimally uh, achieved. So on the right hand side, it's a series of um, resistivity curves uh, for a one family, which is this. Barium, iron, arsenic, doped with cobalt. So cobalt here is a dopant. What is it called? Dopant. That's the thing that uh, introduces uh, the charge carriers. And basically, all the different colors are different levels of doping, so different amount of cobalt doping. And for the parent compound, which is the top one, this is the black curve. You can see it doesn't superconduct. It remains, it remains finite. Um, all of these curves are offset, um, so, so that, to make them clear. But you can see that with certain amount of doping, for example, this, uh, these blue lines, at certain temperature, the resistivity drops. That indicates uh, the um, emergence of superconductivity. So this is the one mechanism, which is that uh, superconductivity emerges by doping. Um, OK, so let me talk about, a little bit about phase diagram. So um, we have, um, in, in, in condensed matter, I guess in the study of um, quantum materials, people usually talk about phase diagrams. And why is that important to know? Uh, so here is an example of uh, H2O, and on the left hand side we know that H2O has three phases: it has gas form, liquid form, and solid form. Uh, but how do you know when this material becomes one phase or the other, and what parameters control these phase phase change? And from knowing all of these things, we sort of get an idea of you know what is the mechanism for making this uh, H2O a liquid what makes a, a, a solid and, and, and so on. So on the right hand side is what is the phase diagram for, for water. Uh, you can see that uh, for this particular example, it has uh, pressure as the vertical axis and temperature as the horizontal axis. And from this, you can see, ah, I know how to get the, the material from water to water vapor or, or vice versa. Or how do I, you know, what is the parameter that controls uh, the material from one one to the other. So this is a very useful um, way to showcase all the possible um, phases of a material and how to go from one to the other and and the parameters important for that. So this is what we often quote for each newly discovered material um, is uh, such phase diagrams. So for our materials, here I show you the phase diagram for the only known two classes of high temperature materials, which is the uh, cuprates on the left and the iron nictite on the right. And here, the axes are such that the horizontal axis is what we, we, were, we talked about before, which is charge carrier doping. So it's the amount of charge you put into the system. And then the black line for each of these phase diagram in the middle is the what's called the parent compound. So it's the undope, where you don't add any charge. And then the, the bottom is has uh, doping uh, either with e electrons or holes. So the hole is pretty much like a lack of electrons so that in the lattice, effectively, you have a positive charge. So basically, hole is a positive charge, electrons negative charge. And then um, 
a vertical axis the temperature. So here, these two phase diagrams are drawn strat statistically such that uh, the colors match. So what that means is that these red bubbles uh, are the superconducting phases. So they show you how much you have to dope to get the material to become a superconductor. And you can see for both classes of materials, they are not superconductors at um, zero doping. Only with doping, either holes or electrons, you get these uh, superconducting phases. You, you can get them to superconduct. And both of these materials in the underdope region, underdope means the close to, to the undope side, I guess. You have these blue bubbles. And these blue bubbles for both of these are magnetic orders. So <laughs> magnetic orders are like, maybe you've heard of uh, like ferromagnetic order or anti-ferromagnetic order. Basically, it's an arrangement of spins on the lattice. So uh, let's look at the two lattices. And we're going to focus uh, for the group rates on, a, on the copper plane, because this is what import, what's important for superconductivity in the group rates. And then for the ties, we're going to look focus on the, um, just the top view of the iron plane, because that's the important thing for superconductivity. And you can see that the spins are ordered in such a way that in the group rates, every other side, the spins flip. So you have an up, down, up, down, and also in the other direction. So this is called the anti-ferromagnetic order. And then for the for the nicktides, um, it is such that uh, the spins are anti-ferromagnetic. They're anti-aligned along, along one direction and then aligned along the other direction. This is what people call a collinear spin density wave because the spins sort of forms like a wave, I guess, uh, intuitively. Um, so this is very interesting because there are only two kinds of high temperature superconductors. And we see that for both of them, there is a large chunk of the phase diagram close to the superconducting phase that has a magnetic order. So it makes you think, aha, uh -huh, so maybe uh, the spin order, spin magnetic orders are important for superconductivity. Why do they always have to you know, appear next to the superconductivity? Uh, so, so the question becomes, can we study the, these two, the, the magnetic phases and try to understand why um, superconductivity occur next to these phases? Maybe by understanding the behavior of these magnetic phases, it can tell us where else to look for, what other materials to look for that has this kind of magnetic order that has the potential for, superconduct for superconductivity. So this is the thought process of uh, our approach of the problem. Um, um, so, so here are the questions. I just rephrase them. Um, what is the nature of these different phases in proximity to superconductivity? And there are two aspects that we can um, uh, talk about. One is, one is that, importantly, these phase diagrams are um, sort of tell us the order, different order of the, of the electrons. So it's important to understand how do the electrons behave in different phases. And the second aspect is how do these phases interact with superconductivity, especially in the case here, for example, where these two phases sort of come together. And um, it, we don't know if they merge or they, they, they sort of um, mix or, 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 what, or what. So these kind of uh, questions may help us to understand the nature of superconductivity itself. So this is the key uh, questions that we will try to answer uh, by the end of the talk. And um, um, so let me talk about the study of ele electrons first. So um, many of the phenomena that we, that we see, uh, for example, the superconductivity or ma magnetism, all of these are actually based on the behavior of electrons in the materials. Um, and the electrons are very curiously arrange, uh, arrange they, they kind of uh, interact with each other and arrange themselves in partic particular orders to have this outward manifestation of what, what we see. For example, if a material is insulator or if a material is a conductor, all of these are based on the behavior of electrons at the, at the uh, very uh, fundamental level. So it's important to understand what the electrons are doing. But studying electrons, it's not enough to know where they are. Um, just like uh, think about if you want to know about the traffic, you, you, you can't just know where the cars are. You sort of also have to know um, the speeds or velocities and directions that they're traveling. So here it shows you the dichotomy of how to think about electrons. One is that 
One is their location, which is captured in what's called real space. Um, and also their velocity or, or their momentum. Um, and this is called the momentum space. So you need information in both real space and momentum space to really get a comprehensive understanding of how the electrons are flowing in the material, just like traffic uh, through, 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 you know, through roads. Um, so I think we're probably more familiar with real space. So I'm going to introduce um, the momentum space um, in the next few slides. Um, so electrons, if you have a bunch of free electrons, um, it's called free electron gas, but just a bunch of independent particles, and their energy, if you think about their energy and their momentum, which is indicated by K here. So, so momentum is, you know, like in classical uh, picture, it's a mass times velocity, but it basically it tells you the velocity and also the speed and also the direction that they travel. But the relationship of a free bunch of electrons um, uh, for of energy on K is, is quadratic, so energy is proportional to K squared. So if you plot that, you get a parabolic uh, line like this. Now, since we're dealing with real materials, we sort of have to put these electrons into a lattice. So what we know about lattice is that it has a period. So it has a very regular periodicity. And this periodicity in real space um, sort of imposes that in the momentum space, that there also there also is a periodicity. So here on the on in the in the in the lattice, there's a lattice constant which is called a. So basically, that means that for the energy versus k uh, relationship, um, there also is a periodicity. So, but but it's inversely proportional to a. So the bigger the lattice constant, the smaller the period in the momentum space. So it can on the bottom basically. Um, we sort of break down break down this quadratic relationship with you know these these periods, and then we fold the bands so that every uh, two pi over a the, the bands uh, repeat themselves, and then you get multiple branches. So you, you get these like what's called spaghetti plots uh, and um, a bunch of lines basically. But what do they mean? Uh, each point in this line, so these lines, um, each point in this line sort of tells you the energy state that electrons can live in a solid. So these tells you all the potential states that electrons can be in the solid. Uh, so it's like a map of where electrons uh, sort of uh, can travel in, in momentum space. Um, and of course, in real, real materials, which is three-dimensional, for example, FCC copper, you get a three-dimensional sort of like a look of the band dispersions, which is shown here. But, but but it's a little abstract, but let me put in maybe connection with real real life a little bit more. So why do we care about band dispersions? I mean, what, what, do, what can they tell us? Uh, here, I want to introduce one more concept. Sorry, this is a little uh, technical, but just one more concept and then we're done. This is called the Fermi level. So basically, it's an energy level um, with below which all the electronic states are filled by electrons taken measured at absolute zero temperature. So every system, there are a finite number of electrons. And if all of the electrons occupy the lowest possible uh, electronic states, there must be an energy uh, which tells us the uppermost uh, field state of these electrons. And that's called the Fermi level. So it's basically an energy below which all these bands are filled. Are, are have electrons living in them. And all the bands above this uh, uh, Fermi level are um, empty, so there are no electrons in them. It's just a, separate, a separating energy scale. And now, now come to the connection to real life. So if, if, if you see bands crossing the, this uh, called EF, Fermi level EF, then this material is a conductor, like copper or, or whatever, any kind of metal. Um, if this Fermi level sits in a place where there are no bands crossing, crossing it, this material is an insulator, like wood or, or whatever. So this tells us just by looking at the band structure, this is called a band structure, um, it tells us that, uh, it tells us about the behavior of electrons, which are the costs for the outward um, manifested material properties. So 
just this whether a material is insulator or conductor is is um, is it's a more straightforward example, but there are many other um, examples where a band dispersions tell us uh, how electrons are uh, arranged, and that's what we'll talk about later uh, in the, in the uh, next uh, part. But just remember, uh, the behavior of electrons uh, tell us how materials behave, like whether it's an insulator or a conductor. So it's very useful to understand uh, this 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 aspect. OK, sorry, that was a little uh, technical. But now let's talk about how do we study, um, how do we study the electronic structure. Uh, you know, if I, by studying, for studying the location of electrons, you can use like, something like a microscope. But how do you study the velocity of, 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 of electrons in the material? And that brings me to the tool, which is called the Angle Resolve Photo Emission Spectroscopy, or we call it ARPEDS for short. Um, it's based on a very cool phenomena called photoelectric effect. This is what Albert Einstein actually got his Nobel Prize for. Um, so, it's, um, so basically, when when light shines on a um, metal or a piece of material, um, they observe that uh, electrons fly out into vacuum, and this is because light is. Um, uh, uh, like a, a bundles of energy which are dumped into the electrons in the material. And these materials absorb these amount of energy. Sometimes it's, uh, when the energy is large enough, uh, these electrons uh, can overcome the um, binding energy of the material and actually just fly out to vacuum. So this effect is, is all we need for this tool, which is called ARPES. So here's the like, schematic of the setup. So for ARPES, the light usually comes from a large facility called a synchrotron. Uh, these are actually really large uh, facilities. And what happens is uh, electrons are, are accelerated through a ring-like uh, structure. And when electrons go into a ring, they give off uh, a large amount of x-rays. So each of these like uh, pokey things uh, is a branch line uh, where x-rays come out. And, um, and this was actually another accident. Um, uh, when people were doing high energy, uh, this was discovered when people were doing high energy physics, um, where they needed storage rings for for the accelerators, and they, they had uh, they, they and they realized that in the storage rings um, they're actually uh, giving off X rays, and they realized that this X rays can be useful for many um, other applications like biology, looking at uh, crystal structures or protein structures of biological systems or some sort of chemical reactions. And, so um, synchrotron, synchrotrons were born. And uh, there are a, a few, a handful of them throughout the world uh, where people go to do uh, research in all kinds of biology, um, chemistry, physics, and what have you. And um, so we use the light from one of these branch lines, and we shine it through our sample, which is shown here. This is not to scale. Uh, sample is very small. Uh, but these samples usually sit in high, ultra-high vacuum. And when light shines on the sample, as we said, from the photoelectric effect, electrons are uh, ejected out from the sample into vacuum. And these electrons are captured by this uh, spherical thing called electron analyzer. So effectively, this electron analyzer measures the energy and momentum of the electrons. And um, um, energy, just, it's easier to measure. Momentum uh, carries both this velocity, which you can sort of get from the energy, and also the direction at which the electrons uh, fly out. So this, usually, uh, the relative angle of the sample to this analyzer can be moved. Uh, as some beam lines, this whole, uh, this whole thing can rotate in space like this um, to measure different angles. In other places, the sample is uh, rotated. So effectively, the angle between the sample and the analyzer can be changed. And, um, and this um, tells us the momentum uh, information. So by using these con conservations, uh, uh, we can sort of uh, back out the energy and momentum information of the uh, electrons before they were ejected. So what does that tell us? It tells us energy and momentum of the states out of, these, out of which electrons uh, 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 can live in the sample. So that effectively is the electron electronic structure. So this tool is, is very, uh, it's very good tool for uh, measuring, directly measuring the electronic structure. OK, so in real life, this is what a synchrotron looks like. Uh, this is the um, 
advanced light source at the Lawrence Berkeley lab up on the hill where I'm sitting right now. Um, so this uh, brown building houses the synchrotron and um, it's overviewing the, the bay, which is very pretty when you go there for beam time. Um, and here is uh, me standing next to a ARPES, what's called in the station, uh, ARPES machine at the Stanford, uh, the Stanford synchrotron. So here you can you can sort of get a size of this thing. So this whole wall is the part of the circular like uh, synchrotron, and then this this tube down here um, is where the beam is the X ray is guided towards the sample. So sample is sitting somewhere in there, and then behind all this wire, this this is the um, uh, electron analyzer that measures the electrons. So this is the size of the whole thing is in vacuum. So there are lots of foils and wires and whatnot. Um, but it's it's uh, it's great fun sometimes. So basically, we usually go there for maybe a day or a couple of days, um, just camp out there and then measure a couple of different materials. And right now, many of the computer softwares are are automated, so it's not too bad. Um, you can set up some scans and come back with very beautiful data. So yeah. Um, okay. So let me show you some real uh, spectra. So here is the two-dimensional, like just the schematic of a two-dimensional uh, electronic structure. You have energy, and then you have momentum. And this is a parabolic band. And I remember the Fermi level, EF, is marks the energy um, at which uh, the electrons are filled below and empty above. So we can only measure electronic states that are filled. OK, and then, uh, and then you can imagine uh, if if we take a series of these parallel cuts through this momentum space, you can sort of generate a whole cube uh, that uh, of information that tells you the, um, the 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 entire band dispersion, the entire the entire uh, electronic structure, and then from that cube you can generate any kind of cut. For example, a very common kind of cut to make is this constant energy contour. So, in this constant energy contour, it's uh, taken at uh, as its name called, it's uh, at a constant energy, and then um, the axes are the momentum in x direction and y direction. And if you take this cut at the Fermi level, this is called a Fermi surface map. So, in a real material, this is a real measurement on the right hand side. So this is um, uh, a copper surface state, and you can see the beautiful parabolic uh, uh, band, and this indicates the uh, states, possible energy states where electrons can live. Um, so, but this is just a surface state. If you have a real material, like a three-dimensional material, for example, this is a iron nictite, one of the first iron nictite materials. Um, you can see it has very complicated band dispersions, so many spaghetti bands. Um, yeah, and then the Fermi surface can be very complicated, very beautiful. So this is this was one uh, the first set uh, set of measurements that I. I took, um, participated in. It was very mind-boggling for me. So I, since then, I've decided I really want to work in this area because of how beautiful these things are. Um, and you can see these circles of uh, just these. This is basically a map of where the electrons can live in the in the solid. Um, and, yeah, very powerful measurement. Okay, so let's come back to our questions. Just just a reminder: the questions that we're setting out to answer is nature of the different phases. Uh, next to the superconductivity. Um, so the first question is, how do the electrons behave in different phases? So let me let me do a, um, we draw a schematic of the phase diagram, just so that we can get a handle of what phases there are. Um, so again, this is temperature versus doping. Um, this this bottom dome is the superconducting dome, and the left, left hand side is the undoped com parent compound. There are actually two lines, two uh, phase transition lines uh, coming down. Um, there's a higher one, which is called TS for structural transition, and a lower one for TSW, which is the spin density wave transition. So let me just uh, iterate what sort of, uh, what uh, talk about what each of these phases uh, uh, do. So if we start out in the normal state, normal state just means it's outside of all these phases, so it's the most normal state. Um, of all, so um, in, in at this position, the um, the the crystal is called paramagnetic tetragonal. Uh, basically, what it means is paramagnetic means that the spins are not ordered, so the, the there's there's no ordering of spins. Tetragonal just means it's a square. Um, so basically, the two directions are indistinguishable. 
And on the left hand side, I'm showing you the what's called the unicell, which is the smallest, smallest, um, smallest unit uh, in the lattice that repeats itself over the throughout the solid. Um, that unicell is this green square here, um, drawn here. And these are the iron and the arsenic. And on the right hand side, I'm drawing you, you, you effectively the unicell in momentum space. So it's the smallest unit which repeats itself in momentum space. So these two are uh, uh, sort of like uh, inverse of each other. So you, as, you, as, uh, as we talked about before, the larger uh, it is in real space, the smaller it is in momentum space. Uh, but this is the what's called Brion zone. It's, 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 it's what's called the, for equivalent of a unit out in the momentum space. Okay, as we go through TS, uh, what happens is the material becomes squeezed a little bit along one direction and then elongated a little bit along the other, other direction. So it effectively goes from a square to a rectangle. Uh, and then effectively the momentum space is it's squeezed along the longer direction and uh, elongated along the shorter direction because it's inverse it's inverse proportional to the lattice constant. So it's one over a. And this is a transition called going from tetrachnal to orthorhombic. The spins are still disordered, so they're still paramagnetic. Okay. And then the next transition is the spin density wave transition. So basically here the lattice is not changing anymore. What's changing is the spin structure. So the spins now become ordered all of a sudden. Um, as we said, ferromagnetically aligned along the um, shorter direction and then anti-ferromagnetically along the longer direction. But this has an important change on the unit cell because, because of this ordering the spins, the smallest unit is no longer this green one, but it becomes this bigger uh, black one because uh, the spins are ordered in you know, such, such a way this is the smallest unit now. And effectively, that means in the momentum space, the brain zone becomes smaller than what's before. So, so the in the momentum space, things happen uh, inversely to what happens in the real space. So just, just keep that in mind. OK, and then finally, it goes through superconductivity. Nothing happens in the lattice or spin. It just the electrons pair up to become superconductors. OK, and then we're going to uh, explain sort of uh, uh, study uh, the electrons uh, that goes the, the changes the electrons go through through each of these transitions. So we're going to start with a structural transition. So this structural transition, I sort of exaggerated on the plot. I said it squeezes a little bit on this direction, elongate on, along the other direction. But actually, the lattice distortion is tiny, tiny. It's only the change in the lattice is only 0.3 percent. So it's, it's very, very small. And however, even even though it's small, it's still qualitative change on the symmetry. So, in the tetragonal phase, the things are the two directions are um, are indistinguishable. So it's called C four symmetry, which means that if you rotate the thing by ninety degrees, it doesn't doesn't change. It's still the equivalent. Um, but because of the the orthorhombicity, even though it's small, the two directions are no longer the same, and you have to rotate by one eighty degrees to to get to get the, the same structure again. So this becomes uh, the symmetry is lower to call C two symmetry. So this is kind of like a it's called a symmetry breaking. And um, so so you think about this is just what happens to the lattice, but actually something happens also to the electrons in these materials. Something large happens. So let's let's talk about what happens. Um, to study this, uh, I have to first talk about technical difficulty, uh, which sort of shows you some of the interesting things you can do with, with research, um, which is, um, so when, when, th when, when these materials become squeezed in one direction, you can imagine a large, uh, in a large co uh, compound, some part of the sample may squeeze along the x direction, some parts of the sample may decide to squeeze along the other direction. So you end up with a material that has um, what's called domain, so like uh, parts of it the domains that are that are nine degrees rotated. So, on the right hand side is a optical image where you see sort of these faint stripes, and the dark and white stripes indicate um, <laughs> domains that are nine degrees rotated. So, in for example, the white parts you have a uh, sample squeezed along the y direction. On the black domains, you have them squeezed along the x direction. So, 
this makes measurement really difficult because when you, whenever you measure on such a sample, you get an average of these two domains. And so you cannot really see the intrinsic behavior of a single domain. So our uh, colleague um, came up with this really smart way where they he just like designed a, a mechanical detwinning device which squeezes the sample along one direction. And that was enough to get rid of this domain. So you end up with a sample that is just largely of a single domain, making this kind of measurement possible for many different probes. So for their measurements, they measured the resistivity. And what they found was that um, you can just focus on one of these plots. This is for different doping. So, but, but effectively, they're all the same. So you can see that different colors are resistivity along the shorter and longer directions. And they are very large. So the difference is very large. For example, this 2.5%, the difference is a factor of two. And you can think about only 0.3% lattice distortion. How can it you know, get a change of this size? So it means that something must be going on beyond the lattice distortion. So that's where we come in. So we look at the RPS measurements. And so in, this is a normal state, which means that the lattice is still, is still square. And here on top is the measurement along the orthogonal directions. And you can see they are the same in energy, So which means which it's kind of saying they're degenerate. But when we cool down below these transitions, what we see is that these spans are no longer the same. So along the, the longer direction, if the span is, uh, comes across the Fermi level, whereas for the other direction, it goes lower in energy. So this shows that the rotational symmetry is indeed broken by the electrons. And moreover, I've colored these bands in red and green and labeled them dx and dyz. That refers to the orbitals uh, where the electrons reside. So uh, maybe you have learned that uh, um, uh, electrons on atoms, they reside in different orbitals. And for these iron materials, there are five different orbitals they can stay in, x, z, y, z, x, y, and x squared minus y squared and z squared. So here, what, what we're seeing is that this symmetry breaking actually happens in the orbital degree of freedom, which means that the orbitals, the different, the, the x and y z, which should be um, um, symmetric in the tetrahedral state, they are filled different. They are filled up to different amounts in the in this state. So it means that the orbitals, there's some sort of ordering of the orbitals, such such that such that the rotational symmetry is broken. So this is beyond what happens to the lattice. So just to, just so the question is. Uh, at which transition this occurs. To see that, we do like a systematic temperature dependence uh, where, um, so this is a dope sample on the right-hand side. And we, we make this measurement for a series temperatures. And we see that at high temperature, they're equivalent. And, um, and they, as temperature is lowered, uh, one, one set of bands sort of go down, one set of bands raised up. And that initial uh, hap, uh, um, lifting of, of bands happens well above the ICW, ICW transition, which is a lower temperature. So that means that the transition must be related to the structural transition, the higher temperature. So the symmetry breaking is related to TS, to the structural transition. And if we just plot the energy difference of these two bands and do that as a function of temperature, we see it's very similar to the resistivity measurements, which means that this sort of explains the, 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 their observation of this large anisotropy in the resistivity. Uh, so here we're seeing that this is what the electrons doing. Now, just take note that this energy scale is on the order of 80 millivolts. So let's think about, again, this um, lattice distortion. So it's only 1.3%. Um, can we say one way or another whether um, the lattice distortion can make this kind of change? To do that, we, we, we can do theory calculations. So uh, in theoretical calculations, they can put in by hand the lattice distortion, and they see that only a change of 10 millivolts is possible with, from this small lattice distortion, which is much smaller than what we observe. So this tells us that the lattice distortion cannot be the cause of this symmetry breaking, but it's actually the result of what happens to the, to the electrons. <coughs> so basically, this is saying that at a certain temperature, the electrons decide to, to to occupy different orbitals such that, and this ordering is so strong, it drives drives the lattice to have a distortion in a certain way. So, uh, so this saying that this occurrence is um, is electronic in origin. So this is what we found, and this is also responsible for the resistivity and the Okay, so that's the TS. 
as I'm a little uh, running behind. So uh, let's talk briefly about the SCW, the spin density wave transition. So for this, we're going to use a different compound um, because the in this compound, the TS and TSCW are well, well separated, so we can sort of separate their effects in temperature. And I'm going to show you schematically of what happens and then show you the data um, because it's, um, to, to confirm. So again, in the tetragonal state, the system is um, here at the orthogonal direction, the x direction, the y direction. These bands are are, are same in energy. And um, as we go through TS, uh, as we learned before, one set of bands sort of moves up, and this red band moves down. Now, when we go through the SEW transition, remember we talk about this um, doubling of the unit cell because of the spin order, and that effectively sort of um, cuts cuts down the this Brillouin zone momentum space by by a half. So the so this band, so the bands at the Y point sort of fold in to the to the to the center, and and vice versa. So there is a what's called a folding of bands because because now the uh, smallest unit cell in the momentum space is uh, smaller than before. So on the band dispersion, you will sort of start to see uh, fine features. To, uh, where there used to be not not any bands. So I'm going to show you a, a short movie, which is a series of measurements taken at different temperatures, coming down from high temperature through first through TS, where you will see uh, that this, this white band sort of shifting up, this white band coming down, and then and then you will see when we go through SCW at a lower temperature, there are some fine features developing, which is result of this folding. This yellow line just stationary, just a, a reference guide. So here we're coming down in temperature, and I just focus on this band here. You see at a certain temperature, starting about now, this band starts to shift up, and this band starts to shift down. And the lower temperature, you have these fine features uh, here, uh, which were not there before. That indicates the folding of the SEW. Hmm. Yeah, so just to summarize, so. In the high temperature state, the two directions are, are the same. And then when we go across the structural transition, we've seen that this band sort of moves up, this band moves down, which breaks the, which breaks the symmetry in the, in the two directions. And finally, when we go through the SCW transition, we see that you have these fine features there, which is, re which, which is the result of these two bands uh, folding on top of each other. OK. Um, let's. This is a brief uh, summary of what we have learned, uh, which is that um, the two transitions at, have different behaviors for the, uh, for the electrons. At the structural transition, we see that it's the rotational symmetry which is being broken, and more importantly, this is due to the ordering of the electrons. Uh, which is strong enough to drive drive the uh, changes in the lattice. So this is a very this is this is the phase that is electronic in origin of the lattice, which is kind of amazing if you think about it. Just the small electrons that are ordering on a lattice is strong enough to drive the lattice to change in certain ways. Um, this is kind of you know mind boggling. And then at the SCW transition, we observe band folding again. This is consistent with uh, the SCW introducing a new and larger uh, a, a periodicity of a larger unit cell. So this is uh, from a result what's called the translational symmetry broken breaking, uh, which is different from rotational symmetry breaking. So you see that these uh, phases, for these different phases, the electrons behave differently. And the last aspect is that is a question is um, now how do these phases interact with uh, superconductivity? So. Uh, that's the last part, which is when we have a material going through these two phases, what happens when it dips into superconductivity? OK. <laughs> we show that there are three, three, three lines, right? TS, TSCW, and TC. So that indicates there are three different, uh, three different phases. And from the band dispersion point of view, the three different phases have different um, uh, um, different uh, manifestations of change. So let's just summarize for, for the TS, what happens is that there's these bands sort of move up and down in energy. And then for the, the magnetic order, the spin density wave, what happens is bands sort of fold on top of each other. And what I didn't show you before was that when they fold, 
whenever bands cross themselves, they sort of open up a, a, a gap. So bands do not like to cross them, themselves. And when they do, they sort of um, open up a gap such that they don't touch each other. Um, so this is called an energy gap. And this gap happens anywhere that the bands fold and cross the original bands. And finally, for superconductivity, uh, the signature for superconductivity is a gap uh, that opens at, from, at the Fermi level, which is symmetric, totally symmetric. So there's a difference between the superconducting gap and the SEW gap, because SEW gap only uh, happens wherever bands cross, and superconductivity only happens at the Fermi level. So here, all three orders have distinct uh, happenings to the electronic structure. And each of these things is called an order parameter, because each of them is a measurable quantity. Um, and the size of this measurable quantity sort of tells you the strength, strength of, uh, of these order. So for example, you can measure how much uh, this band move, uh, shifts in energy. Here, you can measure the size of this gap or the size of that gap. And the magnitude of these measurements um, is a good indicator of how the order de develops itself. So by, by sort of measuring these separate quantities, we can look at how these orders interact with each other. And for example, if we have a compound where there's only one phase transition, that means there's only one single order parameter. And if we, if we measure this gap size, uh, SCW gap size, you see it has a monotonic behavior, which is that it, um, at a certain temperature, it, when the electrons, uh, when the spins order, this gap sort of suddenly um, opens, and then it monotonically increases and saturates uh, towards low temperature. So this is the uh, this is the uh, distinct um, um, behavior of a single order parameter. Now, when we measured a compound where it goes through two transitions, so SCW transition and then superconductivity, this is what happened. So this red line is uh, the gap opening at TSEW, and then at TC, it drops. So if you, if you think about if this SEW order does not know anything about the superconductivity, it would not drop. It would just go on like the black line and, and uh, saturate. Um, but here we see a drop, which means that the SEW order knows about the superconductivity, and it does not like the superconductivity. So it competes with superconductivity. Uh, part of the, the magnitude of this order sort of decreases. This means that the, the magnetic order directly competes with the superconductivity for the same electrons. Just to make an analogy, um, you can think about a dance party. So on the dance floor, for example, this sort of represents the electrons participating in the magnetic order. You have you know, ferromagnetic order along this direction, anti-ferromagnetic order along the other direction. They're all well ordered. But when music comes on, some of these uh, electrons participating in the magnetic order uh, couple together to superconduct. So you're left with a reduced amount of number of electrons participating in the superconduct in the magnetic order. So this sort of shows us how these two orders sort of interact and compete with, with each other. It's not like analogy. <laughs> okay. And that brings me to the summary slide. And so we have learned that um, uh, these phases actually are driven electronically by the, by the uh, arrangement of the electrons, um, and they uh, they are competing uh, orders with superconductivity. So yeah, so so what? This is all about iron nicktides. But very interestingly, uh, just at the same time we were doing this measurements, um, similar studies have been done in the Krupp rays, and um, interestingly, what they see what they saw was that these phases, the spectral signatures for these phases also compete with superconductivity in, in, in the group rates in a very similar fashion. So the signatures for these uh, phases also have a dip when they become superconducting. So this shows that actually there are, these, these behaviors are very similar to, to, to the two classes of high temperature superconductors. So it sort of tells us that maybe to look for other classes of high temperature superconductors, we need to find materials that have these magnetic orders and orders that compete with superconductivity, then you may be able to find potential other potential high temperature superconductors um, that way. So these are the kind of questions and thought process that people um, sort of uh, study uh, in this field.
And um, lastly, but very importantly, I need to um, acknowledge all my collaborators. So in, in our field, um, all of this work is it cannot be done by a single group. Uh, they are done by collaborations with a variety of different groups. And um, we, we did the RPES measurements, and this was done uh, in my uh, PhD group in the actions group at Stanford. And done at, at two synchrotrons. One is the Stanford synchrotron, one is the Berkeley synchrotron. And the samples were grown by um, both um, our collaborators at Stanford and also internationally. And, um, and the, also, we always need theory support. Uh, our theory support for these studies happen to be at our Tom Devereux's group at Stanford. So <laughs> it's a large collaboration. It's uh, very awesome people that we work with. So that's all. Thank you very much. <laughs> All right, so we're going to bring the lights up so you can see our audience. Do you have any questions from the home gallery here for Dr. Keith? <coughs> yes, <coughs> sorry. Yeah, go ahead. All right, so um, early on in the presentation, you were talking about the use of superconductors for like the, um, you know, the trains and different other systems of transportation. And uh, you were talking about how obviously the problem there is we can't keep them cold enough for long enough. So. Yes. I was wondering if there was any uh, relationship between specific heat capacity and superconductivity in the superconductors. Yeah. So yeah. So so I, I only talk about RPS measurements, but mm, there are lots of groups doing um, um, uh, transport measurements where they see their uh, at the superconducting transition you have a um, jump in the specific heat. So yeah, there there this is these are very uh, uh, let's say standard measurements for material uh, growers who, who discover new materials for superconductors. Um, but yeah, do you, is there a reason you asked that question? Do you know, it sounds like you know, you know something about that. Well, I mean, I was just, um, I was just wondering uh, if, if there was any relationship with like, uh, as they got better, uh, you know, specific heat capacity got worse or, or, I mean, obviously better would be nice, but uh, I didn't know if like, as far as like future, Outlook, if it looked uh, uh, bad or good or whatnot. <laughs> but yeah, they, yeah, you you see a very strong signature at the at the onset TC uh, for yeah. So the, these are these are always like the one of the first lines of measurements people do when they find new, new superconductors. Yeah. Um, do you feel like uh, the advances for uh, future superconductivity uh, and superconductive materials, will, will it be coming from experimentalists who come up with new materials, or will it be a, a leap forward for theorists to predict something that then could be made? What, what, sort of where do you see a, uh, is there any group in particular or any area that seems to be making progress? Uh, you will get different answers depending if you ask you. <laughs> I, I know I asked experimentalists, so I know what she's going to say. As an experimentalist, I, I, well, <laughs> you know what I would think. Yeah. Um, I, as, as I said, like the high temperature, the two classes of high temperature superconductors were um, discoveries by accident. Um, they um, sort of go beyond what has been known before, before they appeared. So in that sense, you know, um, you, they, they were not predicted. However, the uh, really the reason the the sulfur hydride that I showed um, that that was discovered last year that was actually a prediction uh, by theory many years ago. Um, the problem was that such high pressure was not achievable until just recently, so mm -hmm. people couldn't really uh, check in that area. But that was a su su success story for theory. Um, so. It's a race. I don't know. Um, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So whenever you showed the superconductor that you made, you got to play around with. You yes. said it was only a very small amount, yeah. uh, and then the rest was foam. Yeah. Whenever you have that, I guess I think it was like quantum lock or something, where it's held there and it's like frozen in space. Yeah. How much weight can that actually support? Like, if you were to push down, I don't know if the foam was because you just wanted to have something larger to hold, or if it was because it can only hold up so much weight. So, like, could you actually, you know, push down with a decent force? Because I mean, you know, if we're going to build a hoverboard, 
<laughs> yeah. So, so the foam was actually there to 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 keep uh, a, a amount of the liquid nitrogen to cool it down. That's why there was a foam uh, because as soon as the liquid nitrogen dries up, then the thing stops being superconductor. But it's really strong. I I tried tapping it and it couldn't really make make it move down. So maybe you have seen. Um, there, there's a video, uh, there's a TED talk uh, uh, on this topic. Is that what you saw, the quantum locking? Uh, I don't know. But, uh, oh, I saw YouTube video that mentioned that term, but I don't know much about it. Okay, yeah, there, there's a TED talk where they talk about it's not just levitating, but it's quantum locking, like you said. If you yeah. flip the thing, if it's um, sufficiently cool, if you flip the thing over, it would still be held in place like that. Um, cool. Yeah, and these things are very strong. So, um, I think in the TED talk he mentioned if you have a piece of superconductor about this big, it could hold up a car. Is that? I think that's what he said. Um, wow. you can look it up uh, later, but you can also look it up the the TED talk on superconductivity. But it's very strong. Uh, people have made you know trains um, levitating you know people and, and just on small pieces. Of, I mean, you know, size small enough to put put, put at the bottom of the train, so it's very strong. Yeah. Lucas, do you have a question? I'm a little off the screen, and I'm sorry about that. But um, earlier, you uh, said that the discovery of the first family of superconductors or high temperature superconductors influenced your career path. Where were you going before? Uh, were you always into superconductors, and like, is that, or were you going to go? And then did that discovery like kind of really focus you in that direction? Yeah. So um, during my um, okay, I guess. Uh, during the beginning of my undergrad years, I worked a little bit in high energy physics because one of the professors I had, um, she she was a particle physics uh, physicist, and uh, she encouraged me to join her lab. So um, for that reason, I, I applied for a it's called SULI summer undergraduate laboratory internship, uh, which brings you to different national labs. And I went to Slack for that, where we sort of work on the linear accelerators uh, components and detectors and you know, it's very different, very different way of doing things. You have really large collaborators, uh, really large collaborations, and uh, you sort of everything is done in the computer. You do modeling. It's it's um, it's also fun. Uh, but I, um, but I, I I also wanted at the end of that, I sort of wanted to do something more material related, more hands on, more like application, like at least with foreseeable application. Uh, so she. Introduced me to a colleague, uh, uh, which is another professor working with superconductor. So I sort of work in his lab, and there I really liked what I was working on. I also sort of like the way that the community works, uh, which is um, it's like um, so. There's I don't know if you, there's a painting which is like blind men and the elephant. I don't know if anybody has heard about that. So it's basically, basically um, people trying to figure out the elephant by putting. Um, Looking at different parts, but I feel like that's in a way what we do. Like each group uses different technique to look at the same problem uh, from a different aspect, and we sort of sort of have to put all of our results together to figure out what is this piece that we're looking at. So I really like that kind of interaction. So that's why, yeah, I stuck with it. It's pretty cool. It's, yeah, it's good to hear when when there's a, a community of scholars like that. Some some folks are a lot more competitive. But it sounds like the superconducting uh, research collaborations are very uh, uh, friendly. Yeah. So well, okay. So some <laughs> theories are not really friendly, but that's you know why they're theorists. We sort of have to <laughs> <laughs> but, um, but yeah, because we we depend a lot on, on each other's results. So I guess that's why it's yeah collaborative. Uh, you might have mentioned this. I, I might have missed it. But why is uh, momentum space inversely proportional to the real space. You were talking about how when you have those the, the lattices and it starts to uh, yeah like, get more fluid. Yeah, could you explain that for me? Why is it inversely? <sighs> Intuitively, you think that I, I would think they'd go together, but I don't. I, I wasn't sure how, and how that related to it. Mm, that's a really good question. I'm not sure. I. Think a way to answer this. Um, that's a really good question. I, I'm not sure I know an answer to that. It's sort of, sort of I sort of like it sort of got ingrained to me. I just took it for granted. But yeah, I should. Yeah, 
figure out a way to explain that. Um, okay, I'll get back. <laughs> but you can check uh, in like there are, there are really good textbooks uh, by Cattell, uh, which is solid state physics. It tells you like you know teaches you the crystal structure how how you can figure out uh, momentum space from real space. And really, yeah. yeah. Okay. Thanks. Yeah. Putting a request to our chair to teach thermal fit or a, a solid state maybe in the next year or so. Yes. Get that on the calendar. Because <laughs> <laughs> that's a great book. I, I remember when I was in grad school, I got to take a solid state class, and oh, I fell in love. It was such beautiful stuff. It was really, really interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Harrison, one more thing. I have one more. Sorry, one more. Oh. So you, you started, you got us a little excited with the, the room temperature superconductors, like in the future. So as a, you know, industry insider, what, what's your opinion on the feasibility of that? Is that something that really could happen, or is that just like a hypothetical? Oh, I definitely think it's, I mean, okay. So um, in my mind, theories should not, are not really should not be the stopper for anything because next day you can come up with you know a phenomena which breaks the theory. Like you, if you remember a couple of years ago, people were saying Einstein's uh, uh, speed of light uh, theory was wrong because somebody uh, found out a you know a, a counterexample and the community sort of you know took that as even though it ended up being you know a, a, a false uh, result, but still like it tells you the spirit of scientific development, which is that. Theory is only a theory based on what we have observed so far, and it doesn't mean that tomorrow you cannot find a counterexample that means that you have to modify your theory to make a more general theory. So I think um, room temperature superconductivity definitely is, is is possible. I mean, we just don't know where it is yet. Um, it could happen by accident, uh, or it can be a prediction of theory. So um, that's our hope, I guess, for the whole field that we can find a material that does that. Um, yeah. But just need a way to get there. Yeah. yeah. Um, in the superconductors, when they um, when they do the flux pinning and pin the magnetic fields, um, yeah. does it does it make it so that they resist translational motion or? Um. So, as long as there is a path of continuous mag magnets which allows this flux to keep flowing, then it's okay. So so hmm. so if you have just um. If you just have a finite, you know, size of a magnet, it would not, it would lock to this, to this, to, to the amount of space it can, it can go within this magnet. But if you have, you know, a, a strip of magnets, then it's free to flow along the magnet. Um, so there's somebody who built a really cool Mobius strip, which have this thing going forever. And that's yeah. So when you uh, when you put it on the circular magnet, and you so if you would have tried to bring it over the top, uh -huh. what would have happened? Or what yeah. happened? What do, what do you mean, the surface? Uh, so, in your, in your video of you, with the, when you pulled out you know, the superconductor and placed it, you had that small circular magnet. Yeah. Um, so if you would have tried to, instead of sitting it on top, if you brought it in from the side, would it have resisted oh. it? Um, if I brought it in from the side, well, if I do it strong enough, it, it would, it would, it would, it would come in. But the the reason that it rotates is because it's a circular magnet, so it, yeah. that that sort of gives you a, a a path to to for the flux to go. Um, okay. Yeah. Okay. Hey, but if you bring it from the side, it may be hard to control it to go in like a perpendicular, uh, like a, 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 a on its face. It may try to flip, or I don't, I don't know. Yeah, but. Maybe you can find a setup to try that yourself. Um, <laughs> We've got to get some of those. Could you send us some that we could we could play with? <laughs> I found out from our um, physics department uh, demo group. So I think this is I don't know where they sell these, but they, they have this. I think I've seen this in many different demos. So I don't know if this is a standard thing that people sell or for 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 education or or, or what. Um, we'll have to see if we can get SPS. Yeah. Come up with some money to. Yeah, the ones that are in the liquid nitrogen range, not the liquid helium, are any of those like available for for purchase? Yeah, I think I think some companies sell them. So YBCO is the 
okay, so so the, the, the most common one people have uh, used is called YBCO. So Y stands for yttrium, uh, B is barium, uh, C is copper, O is oxygen. So so this compound YBCO, yttrium, barium, copper, oxygen is, is the most common uh, high temperature superconductor that people use in applications or cell. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, another question that Harrison's question reminded me of was uh, uh, so you, you mentioned that one that was only last year that was uh, that involved sulfur being toxic and flammable and stuff like that. Yeah. But interesting idea of compressing a gas down to a sulfur. That's something that you wouldn't normally think of being superconductive as a gas. Do you think that that will prompt more people to start looking in that area, just like more uh, reasonable gases that I mean, you still got to keep them cool, but you know, and, and high pressure, but like something that wouldn't be explosive and flammable and toxic. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <coughs> sorry. So that was actually, that was the success story of a theory, of theorists. So that was actually predicted. Um, um, interestingly, that, that um, the key is the hydrogen, which has, um, so the, the, the prediction was that if you subject that, that thing to really high pressure, then you would be able to get a high temperature superconductor. Just, just people haven't, been able to achieve that pressure. So as soon as this group managed to, to get this kind of pressure device, they that's one of the first things they tried. And it really worked. Um, so right now, the, the um, people actively are trying to reproduce the res this, this result, which is hard, because uh, it's one of the very first uh, setups that have been made. Um, but yeah, people are working on it. Uh, even in the US, I think there's a high pressure center uh, in DC, they're trying to reproduce this. Um, cool. Yeah. Well, I've got one question. What would you give as advice to current undergrads? What sort of advice do you have for these folks who are maybe looking at grad schools or looking at areas of physics uh, to perhaps pursue in terms of research? What what would advice might you give us? So. Personally, like I, I really benefit a lot from research uh, during undergrad. So, um, and there are during, especially during the summer uh, when you don't have classes, you can have much more time to 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 try different research. And there are lots of very great um, undergrad internships, uh, research internships. Um, one is the one I mentioned, which is called SULI, uh, S U L I. Um, this is the uh, summer undergrad laboratory internship. So what they do is. Uh, they bring together maybe 20, 30 undergrads from all over the U.S. to each um, national lab and pair them up with the mentor. And they can work on a, a project over the summer. And by the end of summer, they can uh, write up a presentation and paper and summarizing their their um, their findings. And it's really it's a really great uh, program because not only do you get to meet with other um, undergrads from all over the world, you kind of get a sense of what is it like to be at like, like a national research centers and uh, make some really great connections and network and and some of these mentors can you know um, help you to figure out what you want to do in the future and show you different um, you know other sort of opportunities available and um, and there are also other REU programs which are great, but I, I, didn't, I didn't try those. But still, there. I think just getting involved in research early. Don't don't think you don't know anything. I think um, what people. I think what these uh, places really really look for the enthusiasm in undergrads, um, and that really is all it takes to to get involved in research. So um, just don't don't think you you can't start young. You can start you know now whenever. You know, you decide to apply. So, um, and try maybe if you have the time, try maybe one or two different, uh, very different research areas. Like for me, I tried high energy physics and um, condensed matter physics, and um, and you, not only do you get a taste of what it's like to do the science in the area, but also it's important to get a feeling of um, what is it like to work in that community. Like, what is their working style? Like, do you work with a lot of people or only a few? And, these are things very, very good for deciding what you want to do in the future um, as well. So, cool. All right, that's great. Do we have any other questions here from our phone audience? Well, let's thank our speaker.
This has been fantastic. Thank you for doing this seminar, even feeling under the weather. We really appreciate your time. Thank you very much. Thank you for having me. I really enjoyed it. Oh, great. This is fantastic. It would be very difficult to have a, uh, an expert in superconductivity come give a talk. So this is, this is great. We really enjoy it. Thank you. Thank you. Me too. I'll send you an email later, and uh, we'll uh, uh, chat a bit more. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank <laughs> you.